Welcome back, everyone, to our classroom called the College of Glycation. Once again, my name is Paul Reynolds. I'm a biomedical scientist and a professor of cell biology. And today we're going to tackle a topic that connects the dots between the sweet things that we eat and the not so sweet health outcomes that may follow. We're talking about glycation, as we've done in the past, and how it particularly acts as a molecular wrecking ball in the development of worsening metabolic syndrome. If you've been following along with previous episodes, you've already been introduced to the basics of glycation. But today we're going deeper. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of interrelated conditions that together increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, stroke, and other major chronic diseases. According to major health authorities like the International Diabetes Foundation and the World Health Organization, metabolic syndrome is a syndrome defined by the presence of three or more of the following five components. Abdominal obesity, elevated fasting blood glucose, elevated blood pressure, increased triglycerides, and low HDL cholesterol. We'll look at how a central chemical process, glycation, drives the conditions that we collectively call metabolic syndrome. So let's begin with a quick recap to get everyone up to speed. Glycation is a non-enzymatic reaction, meaning it doesn't require any biological assistance, where sugars, the most common of which would be glucose and fructose, bind directly to proteins, lipids, and even your DNA. This reaction is a bit like pouring syrup into the gears of a machine. Over time, the affected molecules become sticky, stiff, and dysfunctional. The final products of this glycation reaction are called advanced glycation end products or ages. And these ages accumulate over time and cause structural and functional damage in nearly every organ system of the body. What's more alarming is that they're highly reactive, meaning they can trigger oxidative stress and chronic inflammation wherever they settle. Now, this is not just theoretical chemistry, I promise. The formation of ages has been well documented. Several years ago, 20 years ago, in 2005, there was a review by Ramaswamy et al., and the link is in the show notes. You could see this reference. Researchers in this case described how ages interact with a specific receptor called RAGE, or the receptor for ages, and in the process triggers inflammation, oxidative stress, and ultimately contributes to chronic diseases including diabetes, neurodegeneration, and cardiovascular disease. So let's examine how these ages relate to metabolic syndrome specifically, a modern-day epidemic characterized by a group of risk factors that dramatically increases your chances of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. These risk factors include, as I've mentioned, high blood sugar, elevated blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol levels, and increased weight circumference or obesity. What's so intriguing and even alarming is that ages seem to be involved in nearly every one of these conditions. For example, ages damage the lining of blood vessels by making them less elastic. Imagine trying to inflate a balloon that's been left out in the sun too long. It becomes brittle and unyielding. That's essentially what ages do to arteries. They contribute, therefore, to higher blood pressure. They also modify cholesterol particles, turning LDL, often referred to as the bad cholesterol, into an even more dangerous form that easily gets trapped in blood vessel walls. Perhaps the most critical impact of ages, though, is in their role um, in insulin resistance which is the centerpiece of metabolic dysfunction. Insulin, you'll recall, is a hormone that allows glucose to enter your cells so it can be used for energy. 
In a healthy system, insulin works like a key that unlocks a door, allowing the sugar into the cells. But in insulin resistant conditions, the locks have become jammed or corroded, thanks in part to glycation, and the key no longer works very well. The body compensates by producing more insulin, but over time, the system becomes overwhelmed. Blood sugar levels start to rise, which leads to even more glycation. And this is where things spiral into a vicious cycle. Elevated blood sugar fuels glycation, and the resulting ages damage the very cellular machinery responsible for responding to insulin. Now, this damage has been shown many times in the literature. This feedback loop specifically has been confirmed in multiple studies. For example, in 2006, a publication by Golden and colleagues um, resulted in the publication of a pivotal review in the journal called Circulation. And they showed how ages contribute to diabetic vascular injury. They found specifically that ages not only impair insulin signaling, but also promote a state of persistent oxidative stress and inflammation, leading to even further metabolic damage. Ages have been shown to bind to insulin receptors on cells, impairing their ability to transmit that message that should be preserved with insulin alone. At the same time, they also activate rage. I've mentioned that already. This sets off a cascade of inflammatory signals, amplifying cellular stress and making insulin resistance worse. It's a perfect storm of hormonal dysfunction and molecular mayhem. When the process contributes or continues unabated, it doesn't just lead to elevated blood sugar. It also paves the way for obesity, a hallmark of metabolic syndrome, particularly the dangerous kind of fat that accumulates around internal organs known as visceral fat. This type of fat is especially reactive to glycation. Adipose tissue or fat tissue exposed to ages become more inflamed, more insulin resistant, and more prone to releasing fatty acids into the bloodstream further disrupting metabolism. In the pancreas, ages stiffen the tissue and impair its ability to secrete insulin effectively. This means that the very organ that's responsible for controlling blood sugar becomes progressively less capable of doing its job. Now, it's worth noting that not all ages are made inside the bodies. And all of you that have tuned in over the preceding weeks know about this well. A significant portion comes from our diets, especially foods that are cooked in high dry temperatures, like fried or excess grilling foods, um, and highly processed snacks. These foods are loaded with exogenous ages, or ages that are made outside the body, and when we eat them, we absorb some of these molecules directly into the bloodstream. Studies have shown that people who consume a diet high in ages have greater markers of inflammation, insulin resistance, and oxidative stress. In contrast, those who follow a low age diet, they more often will steam, boil, or eat foods raw, show measurable improvements in metabolic health. Another important point in understanding glycation and metabolic syndrome is the self-perpetuating cycle between hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, and age formation. You'll know that blood sugar levels rise often because of insulin resistance. Insulin can't do its sugar packaging role. And the increased availability of glucose that results leads to more glycation over time. More ages then form and interfere with insulin signaling, which then turns to even higher blood pressure and blood sugar. This feedback loop doesn't just damage the pancreas or insulin receptors, it also affects the mitochondria or our cells energy producing structures. Ages increase the risk and incidence 
of the expression of reactive oxygen species or ROS, which then further harm cellular function and accelerate metabolic decline. Now this sounds bleak, I, I hear you, but there are strategies that we can use to interrupt this cycle and protect our metabolic health. First and foremost, as we've mentioned before, we need to do better at controlling blood sugar spikes. These are the excursions. This can be achieved through methods like intermittent fasting, missing a meal periodically, no longer is necessary. Um, unless you would like to do long-term fasting, there are some benefits. But just skipping the meal periodically or intermittent fasting will help. You can reduce, reduce your refined carbohydrates and eat a more balanced meal that has protein and fiber. These habits reduce the substrate glucose, which is the thing that is most available to exacerbate or worsen glycation. Another powerful intervention is physical activity. Regular exercise enhances the body's ability to take in glucose independently of, of insulin, especially through the activation of a special glucose transporter called GLUT4. This means that by simply using your muscles, you can reduce blood glucose levels and alleviate some of the pressure on your insulin system. Exercise also boosts mitochondrial health, helping your body better manage oxidative stress and metabolic waste products. Additionally, supporting your mitochondria through adequate sleep, nutrient-based food, and targeted supplementation where appropriate, like magnesium and B vitamins, can enhance your body's resilience against glycation. And of course, let's always strive to reduce our intake of exogenous ages, the ages that we find in foods, by altering sometimes how we cook our food, um, which can be a simple yet effective way to slow the process. Ultimately, glycation is more than just a chemical curiosity. It's a major player in the story of metabolic syndrome. And if we want to preserve our energy, clarity, mobility, and longevity, we need to respect the role of insulin, blood sugar, and the sticky sugar-coated proteins that quietly accumulate with every sweet bite and sedentary hour. As one study put it, ages aren't just biomarkers of disease, they are mediators of disease. That means they don't just reflect poor metabolic health, they actively drive it. So where do we go from here? Well, awareness is the first step. Action, therefore, is the next. When we understand how glycation feeds metabolic syndrome, we can begin to make meaningful changes, starting with our plates, our habits, and our movement. Remember to stay curious. Keep learning about your metabolic health because knowledge can lead to better outcomes. Thanks one and all for joining me today. I'll see you next time.